Yes, it is. Here and now, we are here to take it on. Take on the whole revolutionary struggle, transforming the whole world at this time. Everywhere, there's revolutionary struggles. In England this week in London, there was, I mean, it looked like a million to me. It was claimed to be a million people out in the streets there in London. You know, calling for a complete embargo on arms to uh, design a state. But it seems that uh, Lamy is behind uh, the uh, military campaign in the north against uh, Hezbollah, changing the target, you know, to Hezbollah now. And they plan to do some kind of major action there that's being supported by both not so great Britain and uh, the United States of America. They're not uh, supporting the any. Uh, a major military action against Iran, in contrast. But Lebanon, yes, they're after that, you know, because Gaza is stalemate. So they're going after Lebanon now, it seems to me. The mm -hmm. U.S. has two uh, aircraft carriers in the region as well to send in planes as, uh, to bomb, bomb Hezbollah, I suppose, together with uh, the Zionist Air Force. If they do that, then it'll still set off, you know, a whole regional war. Iran will be obliged to step in as well. Yeah. That's what they're planning. It's amazing that how dedicated the UK and the US are to be the world's bullies and to make sure that everyone knows that they or that they are that they they are determined to be the top dog. Yeah. In charge. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're, we're in charge, not you. And we'll show you we're in charge. Yeah. 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 And and Israel is simply the puppy, the 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 paper tiger puppy that um does what master it says to do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I think the uh, Netanyahu is playing for time as well because he's uh, he's waiting for his favorite Trump, you know, to become elected. And Trump has told, has given him sort of like a green light. You know, what was that, you know, comment of his, you know, like finish it off or end this soon or something like that. Is that what he said? You know, like, I don't what know. does that mean? <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, well, well wait, what does that mean? And, you know, um, the Israeli, the Israeli regime, you know, they can wait. They can wait as long as they, they can wait. Their program will not change under Trump or under Biden or under Harris. Their program will not change. The U.S. program, I, I don't see how it could change mm -hmm. because U.S. imperialism has a, has a vested interest in Israel's aggressive um belligerent posture in in the region against the Palestinians and all and all the Arab countries. So I I don't see what change Trump would make. I, I don't I don't see if you remember Trump killed Soleimani. So so much of him being a friend of a friend, a friend of the Palestinians. Hmm. You know uh, this uh, this uh you know, uh, this blank check that um, the USA has uh, has written for, for the Zionist state, you know, seems in a greater context to be like an act of desperation because they consider that the Arab countries are ripe for revolution and they cannot depend upon the regime in place to guarantee their, uh, their uh, corporate interests there. Therefore, they have to have a backup plan, plan B in any case of any revolution anywhere, like Nasser, that, you know, the Zionist state can move in there, you know, with the U.S. arms and take it over, you know, and settle it, settle accounts in that way, you know, with any revolutionary struggle. In fact, that's what the strategy of Britain and France was, you know, when Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Israel stepped in there together with a backup from the you know, United uh, you know, Kingdom and uh, France to take uh, control of the Suez Canal. And uh, Israel was, you know, essential to that scheme of things. And now it seems like 
US, you know, is becoming dependent upon such a strategy as well, because it's an admission, you know, that their friends in the Arab world are not permanent and they are looking for a permanent partner. And that's what the Zionists, you know, offering them. And they've got, you know, the, uh, the social base to do it too, you know, they had the social base, you know, they had the popular support to, to go for it, you know, greater Israel even, you know, used to be sort of, you know, like a popular populist thing. But now that's changing too. You know, this is like a big game of chess, you know, and uh, there's a number of uh, players who are putting the um, King Netanyahu uh, in check together with the international legal process. He's going to be declared a criminal being and all that. So, huh. So we're seeing, you know, what's going to happen in Lebanon now. That's, you know, the meanwhile in the West Bank, you know, it's like a, a whole uh, reoccupation of of what had been left uh, in the uh, Oslo Agreement. You know, the last bit, you know, of territory, you know, Sector A has been reoccupied in the key sectors, Janin, Nablus, Tukaram, Kankilia, uh, all those, you know, cities in the north there, you know, where the uh, political movements, you know, were getting stronger and stronger. And the uh, brigades, you know, got themselves organized beginning with Janin to repel any incursion into the refugee camps there by the Zionist military occupation. Well, that's getting stronger. And the resistance has not been put down. And uh, the, uh, the counter-revolutionary Zionist forces, you know, are being pushed back. They were just pushed out of, you know, Janine after 10 days. All the damage they've done, 40 kilometers of ro paved roads that were damaged you know, by the tractors, all that's being repaired within four days. So, you know, they're not leaving. You know, the, you know, the whole strategy of this um, Zionist campaign, both in Gaza and in the West Bank, is failing, you know, because they're not leaving. First of all, you know, Egypt will not let the Palestinians leave Gaza. They've got the whole military, you know, stationed at the Rafa crossing there, you know, with acres and acres of tanks <laughs> waiting for any sort of, you know, uh, any incursion whatsoever into Egyptian territory. That's not going to work. So now they back themselves into a corner. Yeah, that's what it, what it seems like to me. Hmm. I wish Ahmed were here to tell us, you know, like what's happening internally. Well, I can tell you that uh, I saw a report yesterday on TNT News that the Mossad agents in Turkey are getting set back tremendously. They have a spy network that they have set up in uh, around the region to to target Palestinians and also uh, Iranian assets who live or who work in Turkey. And uh, they made a big arrest last week. Uh, the Turkey and military intelligence and, and national police. It, it, it was on TNT News. They might want to look it up on TNT News. And they basically were saying that um, Mossad feels it has the right to set up these, these, these offices around the region to spy on the government and spy on the Palestinian and, and Iranian activists. Um, and they take advantage of poverty of um, Palestinians who might move to uh, Turkey, Istanbul, or, or uh, other cities who need money or who are impoverished and got a way out of, of Gaza or the West Bank, and they want to use them as spies against the Palestinian movement by giving them money and uh, things that they need be, be because of their poverty. Um, there have been many arrests over the last few weeks. And they are hoping for more arrests um, because the counterintelligence agencies are targeting the Mossad, who is targeting Palestinian and Iranians living in Turkey to, to, to get them to become spies. I said, I, I saw, I saw this yesterday evening. Mm -hmm. I don't have the link to show you the story, but it it does exist, and I can um, I can make it available. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I wonder what's happening, though, with the uh, student movement, as you were saying, 
there has been a, a conferencing, you know, that's been preparing, you know, for, and the counter revolutionary, you know, forces are organizing as well. You know, I've seen reports of, you know, what they want to do to confront the student encampments again. Well, the student move, the student movement in, in the U.S. is uh, up and running. Many of the, many of the universities have opened have opened up again. Um, I have found out from my research that there were some summer organizing campaigns. I didn't know that there were, but I, I discovered that they actually did have the summer organizing campaigns. Um, students are organizing. They're organized around various various themes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share share a screen with you and show you some of the some of the student um, some of the new, newspapers now from the student movement. Let me make this here real quick. Here we go. Let's look here from right here. First is one Columbia. Um, can yeah. you see the screen? Yeah. yeah. So Columbia welcomes students back to campus with arrests. Um, yeah. There's a story here from Jonah Valdez. September five. That this is this is a picture from last year on yeah. on Columbia's campus during the encampment, and basically they were saying Columbia University school year began this week with new North Police Department officers arresting two students in front of campus at pro Palestinian demonstrations. At the rally on Tuesday, dozens of students marched along a metal barricade in front of the Morningside campus. Continuing with their calls for the prior year for school to divest from companies with ties to Israel amid the country's war in Gaza and continuing occupation of the West Bank. The same calls that drove encampments and occupations of Hamilton Hall in the spring, which, is, which resulted in mass arrests and student suspensions. <laughs> the NYPD said officers arrested two 21 year old protesters who were held on suspicions of misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. Obstructing government. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, the funniest thing I've ever seen. Well, yeah. uh, suspicion of misdemeanor. Suspicion of disorderly conduct, suspicion of attempted disruptions, uh, and, uh, and, att and attempted disorderly conduct. Both were later released with tickets ordering their uh, appearance in court. So you had that, you had the movement in Colombia, uh, the demonstration. Also, um, this is another one from Colombia. Um, the students have been saying that many of them, or some of them, have had their academic issues resolved as far as suspension, non-suspension, et cetera. Um, there was a story of one student who can't go on campus. It's kind of interesting that you're stupid, you can't go on campus. I guess if it, I guess they have to do all, all their work online, but they still have, they still are facing, still facing legal problems. So we have, we have all, all the, the students are back. But what I thought interesting was the story here that they had a summer school. They had, they had a summer school protest regarding Palestinian protests. So I, I, I was hoping last, in June or July, I made this comment here on this broadcast that I hope that the Pal that the students would have summer school and talk about strategy, et cetera, tactics. And in fact, they did. They, they actually did have, 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 have a summer program. And... Um, they met across across the summer. They talked about different aspects of organizing, et cetera. So we should see a very robust, determined, and focused student activism this summer. I mean, this this fall, winter, and spring. Um, mm -hmm. NYU has has made a policy that, as I understand it, anti-Palestinian demonstrations are considered anti-Semitism anti-Semitism. So they're going to viciously crack down on these demonstrations because they passed a policy or a law that any that Jewish students can declare that they feel uncomfortable with the demonstrations because the demonstrations mm -hmm. are anti-Semitic, which they are not. There so has to be a, a Jewish action there to counter that. The Jewish movement okay. has to mobilize at that focal point. I agree, and you yeah. have, we, we've talked about that many times. So yeah. Anyway, that's that's the status of the movement in yeah. in uh, the U.S. There also were big demonstrations at the Democratic National Convention last month. Up to forty thousand people showed up in Chicago to demonstrate support of Palestine and Palestinian freedom. Yeah, I saw some of the videos with the police. You know, who were 
uh, taking people in there. But uh, it was strong enough, you know, that they could get away with demonstrating, but they didn't, some, you know, didn't get close at all. You know, like there was one United Panther uh, party or something that had a, a series of speakers at a park nearby, but that was like, did nothing. Then there was, you know, a more militant anti-imperialist uh, faction that was um, holding uh, the street uh, occupations. And the, but they were surrounded by the police on all sides. It was incredible, the mobilization of the police that took place there. They well, the number, you know, five to one. Yeah, the, the demonstrations in Chicago, this is my political perspective, were rendered, I wouldn't say ineffective, but they were not going to get close to the DNC. Yeah. That was not going to happen. So since that was not going to happen, then the organizers had to figure out, well, what can we do? to show our strength in numbers. So you, you might find various attempts to have a, meet, a rally here, a march there, a protest in the park there, something, but there was no, there was, it was, it was forbidden by mm -hmm. the state that the march would even get anywhere close to the DNC. Yeah, yeah. Also, a Palestinian speaker was forbidden as well. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. 100%, no. No Palestinians may speak, period. Yeah. No. So, you know, um, we're st still looking at um, a connection to the student movement in the United States as the outcome of the elections. Um, whether the uh, non committed movement will stay non committed and vote for no one or vote for Jill Stein, Cornell yeah. West, or other people, or, yeah. will, or, or will they be uh, convinced? Or manipulated or pressured to vote for Harris, but right now there is a, there is concern that some of the swing states, um, Michigan being one of them, or what they call battleground states, that yeah. they may lose those states. The, the Democrats may lose those states because of the non the non committed movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what's going on with that. Yeah, I have a an interview with Jill Stein uh, lined up here to share as well. And uh, I haven't listened to much of it yet, you know, so if we listen to it together, we can, I can stop and we can comment upon her comments yeah, good. as we go along. Mm -hmm. Okay, found it. And this is Jill Stein, Dr. Jill Stein. And Pan this a bit and oh yes I remember now you know I can't get the um, audio recorded because I have the audio coming in with my earbud here so uh, um, I have uh, not been able to uh, line this up successfully to share okay. unfortunately um, okay. What I could do is, um, if we take a pause, I could transfer it to the other computer and play it on the uh, audio speakers that are at the time, and then we can continue at that point. So I'm just oh, going to put us into pause, and then we just continue after it's all set up as it should be. Okay, we're well, very good. Well, we, we've made some technical advances, and we're going to share um, this Jill Stein article, the video, excuse me, with our with our... Viewers, what are we doing? Campaign. Um, why is this so important to you? And lastly, I want to touch on Ukraine. Things are escalating there too. Thus, bringing back this nuclear shadow. Um, how would you deal with that as well, relative to the status quo that we have right now? Um, and we are we know how the Democrats will deal with it because they've been dealing with it. We know how Trump will deal with it because he uses Palestinian as an insult. And he said that uh uh Israel should be allowed to finish the job. Um and so we know what they will do, but interested in hearing a little bit about you and apologies uh, that we're running out of time. And then after this, I would love if you have the time to ask you our audience questions because uh a lot of Americans submitted questions for you that they're interested in the responses. 
Great. Okay, terrific. And if we need to run over a few minutes on my end, that's okay if that works for you. Uh, but, you know, these are really important issues. And let me just try to um, address them as succinctly as possible. So, you know, we, we are sitting on a, a powder keg um, in the Middle East right now. And we have been, you know, for decades, basically, uh, because Israel you know, has had basically a, a blueprint of ethnic cleansing from the get-go. And this was not clear for all the world to see until the Israeli National Historic Archives were opened up in the 1990s. And a number of Israeli historians took a look at it again and said that, no, basically this is, this is a policy of terrorizing um, Palestinians from the start, this is not something that happened. This was the plan, was basically to drive Palestinians out from the get-go. And it was a very violent plan from the very beginning. Um, you know, and we're seeing now kind of the, you know, the the end game, the consequence of 76 years basically of of a murderous apartheid state and ethnic cleansing. And, you know, it's been especially bad over the last 16 years. And uh October 7th didn't come out of nowhere. Um, you know, this is what happens when when a people are basically being starved to death and and murdered, you know, in their in their daily lives. Um, you know, Israel has been or I should say Gaza has been basically an open air prison where people are hardly fed. And then starting on October 8th, I think it was, you know, massive uh, starvation essentially was imposed on the whole population and food and water and medicine and fuel were all cut off as housing was destroyed, sanitation was destroyed. I mean, it is a living hellscape and all institutions, housing schools, um, universities, healthcare centers, hospitals, everything is destroyed. People are living, um, you know, in absolutely horrific conditions, um, you know, that almost like, that are, are almost indescribable. Children are being, uh, uh, targeted and shot by snipers as are civilians in general, but especially children. What's going on is unbelievable. Uh, a population of 2 million people has essentially been tortured for nine months and uh, and they are being murdered. And, you know, this is just uh, incredible. Um, and Israel has really, um, you know, through, through its broader hostile uh, policies, it has really roused its neighbors and these two back-to-back -back assassinations carried out last week has really, um, you know, pushed this to the breaking point. And it's very telling that Israel assassinated the leader of the uh, ceasefire negotiations. That tells you how much Israel is interested in negotiating uh, a, a solution to this crisis. And you know, and there have been hostilities between Israel and its neighbors for, for quite some time. And those are absolutely, you know, going, um, uh, you know, just off the rails. The U.S. is fundamentally responsible here because the U.S. has enabled all of this. We provide the weapons, we provide the military funding, we provide the diplomatic cover, um, you know, we provide intelligence. And it's so ridiculous that the U.S. stands there and they wring their hands. Oh, how can we rein Israel in? I can't imagine how we could ever rein Israel in because the U.S. is the one that is enabling this. U.S. could rein Israel in, enforce compliance with international law with the ICJ uh, decisions in, a, in the blink of an eye. And prior presidents have done this, both Eisenhower and Ronald Reagan have done this when Israel was going over, you know, uh, was massacring people beyond the borders of, of uh, Israel and Palestine when the massacres, you know, rolled into uh, Lebanon, um, you know, uh, Reagan called it to a halt. And basically, you know, they can do that. They can do that because we are making it possible. So all we have to do is withhold the weapons, which by the way, are illegal. Anyhow, under US law, we cannot be providing uh, military assistance to countries that are violating humanitarian law, that are uh, interfering with the delivery of humanitarian aid, and which are violating nuclear weapons treaties. And Israel counts on all three scores. So that 
assistance is illegal uh, to start with, just in terms of U.S. law. So it's the president has the authority. I'm sorry. You're referring to the Leahy law. Uh, the Leahy law is one of them. Yes, and there are two others as well, including that it's illegal to supply arms to a country that's in violation of nuclear weapons treaties. And Israel, you know, has nuclear weapons, um, which it tries not to acknowledge, but it's clear that it does, which violates the non-proliferation treaty. So there are three laws basically that are um, that are are being violated. So it's not hard for us to fix this. We have the power to fix this in the blink of an eye. And for the U.S. to be trying to talk Iran and Hezbollah and Yemen uh, out of responding to Israel's aggression is ludicrous because we can control Israel's aggression. And we're telling them to just like suck it up, but we're not doing anything about Israel's aggression. So it's not likely that this, you know, the, these frantic negotiations that are supposedly taking place now behind closed doors, it's very unlikely that that's going to get anywhere because Israel has powerful neighbors. They're all really mobilized right now. This is not just terrible for people in Gaza subject to genocide. This is terrible for the people of Israel. And there are, you know, however many, I'm not sure what it is, nine million, something like that. There are a lot of human beings who are in the crossfire right now. This crossfire is extremely dangerous. If we want the people of Israel to survive here, we need to bring them as well into compliance with international law. And we need to move forward with the ICJ uh, resolution. So how I would do this if I were in the White House right now, or if I'm in the White House come uh, you know, next January, uh, we will deal with this by picking up the telephone and telling Israel in no uncertain terms that the genocide and the occupation are over and that it's time to withdraw to the 1967 borders as the most recent, the second of two ICJ uh, uh, resolutions basically stated. So it's not hard to do this. It's very hard for an empire to back off, which is why we need new leadership and we need to throw the bombs out who are basically driving us towards potential uh, nuclear conflagration right now on several fronts. Throw the bombs out, sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman oh. with Juan Carlos. As the we poor Democracy Now! network, oh, compromised compromised by their funders to be uh, condescending and irrelevant to the Gaza struggle. And they were late. They were late in coming out in solidarity with the Palestinians as well as well as quite a number of other groups. Okay. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Let's take a, let's, let's, let's take a quick break to solve this little technical problem. Okay. Uh, well, that was pretty good. Thanks to Dr. Chilstein. This yeah, is uh, it's made, she made some very good, very good points. Uh, of course, the U.S. system will not allow the will not allow. Well, let me put it to you like this: There's been no mass demand that Jill Stein and others be allowed to have a, oh. a real debate with Trump and Harris. I'm not going to say she's not allowed. If there was a mass movement to demand she be allowed and others allowed to have a debate with Trump and Harris, then it would happen. Yeah. It could happen. Or Jill Stein could invite them to debate on a certain campus. She, yeah. she, could, she could invite them to a debate. Well, there and should that, be some uh, platform that invites them all to a debate, you know, and see who well, shows up. Yeah, the or you know something like that needs to be set up because at this stage, the way that the if I understand it right, and I could be wrong here, the League of Women Voters, whoever set or whoever sets up these debates, 
uh, and maybe the league is no longer doing it. Uh, bans anybody who is not on certain has certain amount of votes and certain certain uh, pre you know this it's a some nonsense requirements. Mm. But this kind of debate would would be helpful. Mm. And Joe Stein, other candidates should be allowed to be on every ballot in the country. Yeah. She, so I hear that she's already on 40 state ballots or, and uh, others, you know, have at least a write-in potential. Right. So uh, it's going to be interesting. And the other, another constituency, a whole other campaign, a whole other movement is um, Dr. Cornell West. Um, but he's not getting, you know, he's not getting the media, you know, work together very well. He needs to get a, he's, he's just building up a team, it would seem. And he hasn't uh, broken into social media like Dr. Jill Stein has. She's doing a good job in that respect, even if she's not getting into the corporate media. Right, right. Yeah. So, but uh, she's very definitive, you know, there's no sort of ambiguity in what she is saying. So I'm very pleased. Well, and uh, she's uh, providing a, an excellent example of, uh, well, she has a, a reformed Jewish background. So she represents uh, the kind of, you know, American Jewish milieu that is um, very large. And the reformed Jewish movement, you know, used to be anti-Zionist. Before uh, Dr. Elmer Berger, uh, with whom I worked uh, during the um, 70s in Toronto, and he was um, from the reform uh, Jewish movement, and he had split off because the... Uh, they had adopted a pro-Zionist position from being an anti-Zionist movement because they uh, argued that they wanted to be Jewish Americans. They didn't want to be, you know, uh, you know Israelites or anything like that, you know. Uh, so uh, they changed, you know, under pressure because there was now com no counterbalance, you know, to the Zionist leadership, which was rather uh, little appreciated before the Holocaust. And the uh, Jewish Bund, you know, disappeared from the scene. And so the Zionists, you know, moved in and took over the the leading positions of the whole Jewish community and not just, you know, their faction. So the Reformed Jewish uh, movement in the United States collapsed uh, to, into Zionism. And Dr. Elmer Berger, he uh, split off and he formed the, his own uh, school of thought. And we worked together for a while. He was excellent. He wrote some books as well. And uh, now we have Dr. Jill Stein, who's come back, you know, with that original tradition, that original anti-Zionist tradition of the Reformed Jewish movement. This could be very big. She could have a big influence, you know. I'm sure they're trying to, you know, forestall any sort of, you know, information reports on Dr. Jill Stein anywhere in the Jewish community. But, you know, that can only sort of last for a certain limited amount of time. There will always be people like me who will inject it. <laughs> and uh, well, I wish I, 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 I have to say, um, no one I know has shared that recent history that you just gave us. Yeah. I had yeah. No, no idea. No idea yeah. at all. Yeah. That was uh, from an old interview that she made. Yeah. I remember that very well. Uh, yeah. She's sharp, sharp, sharp person, sharp woman. Sharp sister. <laughs> yeah, she's a real sister there. Yeah, I really appreciate her. Uh, okay, so as I've, you know, commented many other times, you know, when it comes to Dr. Jill Stein, you know, it's time to chill with Dr. Jill and then uh, we can get some voice, you know, happening here that's not a servant to the uh, Democratic Party uh, hierarchy. They expect, uh, both of these parties expect every American to line up, you know, to be a servant of one party or the other. It's sort of demeaning. Absolutely. It's incredible, you know, the basement of American political culture. They sure do. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, that's good. That's good for this week. And uh, if we can get together with Ahmed at some point when he's not working, then that would be wonderful, you know, to get an inside update on what's going on in Gaza and Palestine. Just want to encourage our viewers, share, make comments, 
give us your ideas and your thoughts. Hit the like button, hit, hit the subscribe button so we know that you're there. Yeah, man. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Long, hard struggle it's been, and it's going to be. And we're there. That's right.